Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. We uh, are returning from a um, short break and continuing our discussion on S7 regarding expungement. And I'm now going to welcome John Campbell from State's Attorneys and Sheriffs um, Association to testify and um, an introduction, I believe. So thank you, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Um, John Campbell, uh, the Director, Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs for the record. Um, and as I believe all of you know, uh, James Pepper, who uh, was our uh, uh, my assistant, uh, he has taken another job. Uh, he has been appointed to the uh, uh, be the chair of the Cannabis Commission, which I think he's gonna do a great job. Um, and we have been very fortunate to uh, have retained um, Evan Meenan uh, to replace him. And Evan was formerly of the Attorney General's office. And most recently, he was the general counsel for uh, the Natural Resources Board. So I just wanted to introduce you and uh, the committee to Evan, who you'll be seeing him. So now you have two Evans in your life. So. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And and welcome, Evan Mean. Let's see. Thank, thank you very to, much. Look forward to working with you. The same. Great. Okay. So, John. Um, Madam Chair, I, I do appreciate uh, the work that the committee has done on this. Uh, as you know, uh, we raised I raised the uh, the issue of the um, uh, the uh, uh, solicitation and issues of involving children and and uh, crimes, sexual assaults, uh, or uh, sexual exploitation of children. And um, you all have addressed that, and we do appreciate that. Um, I think the changes that have been made um, are definitely positive. Uh, the only things that, that we uh, would like to see in, in, in the future, because I, I know that this is still going to be a work in progress, is that uh, a full you know, enumeration of the, um, the crimes so people are aware. And not just, not just um, uh, you know, people in the state, but also you know, for the defendants to really know, you know which, which crimes are eligible and what might, they might be able to, uh, um, uh, to make use of. So if... Uh, I believe that if we are able to get it, I believe judicial oversight is going to be doing it. And uh, they hopefully they'll put this on their, their uh, this will be put on their radar. And then there's a, just a couple of other matters that, um, again, for, for them, uh, one concern that we do have is that currently if a, a state's attorney or if, the, uh, if someone waives um, or stipulates to the uh, uh, to the expungement or sealing, uh, there's no mechanism for the victim to have a um, uh, request a hearing. So uh, again, I think this is something that could be addressed uh, during the summer or fall when the oversight committee uh, looks at this. Um, and uh, just again, one more thing for them to, to, to take a, uh, a look and hopefully uh, address. But other than that, that's, that's all we have to, uh, to add right now. Thank you. So um, I, I appreciate your, your testimony. Can you give me an example of um, victims of what crimes that are currently um, eligible for, for expungement under, under this that would, would um, you said, request a hearing? Um, well, so could, you, could you tell me more about what um, what you're thinking about and your concern. What I'm, what I'm referring to is that if a, uh, under the section, and I'd have to look back to see what section it is, but under the section where, let's say, a, a uh, state's attorney would stipulate um, to um, uh, a, 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 a uh, expungement, uh, they, it doesn't, the, then it will not be going before uh, the, the judge for a hearing. So what I'm saying is if there is a crime um, or if there is a, you know, that is being, uh, that they're looking to expunge. And let's say there is a victim to that crime, then the victim uh, might want to have a, uh, you know, their say, they may not agree with, with what is, uh, you know, with, to the stipulation. And uh, so what I, I believe, and again, this is really probably should come more from the victim's community, but it's just something that, that I noted uh, that it didn't have any, um, uh, it didn't have a mechanism for that. Uh, unless Bryn can tell me I'm, I'm not correct on that. Maybe we did not look at it correctly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. If Bryn has anything to add, but we certainly have noted it and um, also curious as to where else um, a victim has an opportunity to 
come in where, where a, um, the state's attorney has already made a, a decision about the about the case. Uh, Britton. Um, so I'm doing multiple things at once here, um, but let's see. So it's true that throughout um, the bill, there is an opportunity um, depending on the type of crime um, for a person to uh, seek an early um, expungement or sealing, but the but the bill does provide that the prosecutor's office would have to stipulate to that. So um, if I'm if I'm, I'm hearing some of the testimony, I'm kind of coming in and out. Um, but I if I understand correctly, the testimony is that there is a concern that the victim wouldn't have an opportunity to testify at a hearing um, if that stipulation took place. Is that is that That's right? True. Um, so yes, but the prosecutor would need to stipulate. So I, um, but yes, that's, that's correct. If there wasn't a hearing, then there wouldn't be an opportunity, but again, the prosecutor's office would have, um, the, I, I think that the prosecutor's office typically would interact with the victim prior to, um, stipulating, but again, I would let the prosecutor's office weigh in on that. And, you know, we do have 14 different prosecutors and, and all feel differently about, you know, certain things. And um, I believe that some are more prone or there might be a couple that are more prone to um, uh, giving, um, you know, stipulating and uh, and not uh, possibly requesting a hearing uh, in order for the, uh, the victim to be heard. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any questions for, for John Campbell? Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Oh. <laughs> I always talk slowly because I know <laughs> sometimes it takes a, a minute to get those hands up. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, and I raise my hand late lots of times. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, John, just to just to make it clear, uh, I know a couple of weeks ago you were. Um, um, not happy with a lot of the language that was in there, and, and uh, you know, some of it I agreed with you. But but now I, I, I'm not asking if you're su uh, supporting the bill. Um, I mean, if you are, that's fine. But uh, um, I guess my question would be: Are you not opposing it? No, we're not not opposing it. And it's not that I don't su support the bill because I, I believe it's it, you know what we're what the legislature is trying to do here is is good uh and it's going to provide um you know certain people who have uh, committed crimes uh it, you know to start with a clean slate and i and i do believe uh in in a lot of the um uh you know what the good that this will do it's my my only concern is that that when you're you know doing legislation when we're when we're uh, creating legislation um i guess maybe this is because of being a lawyer i i always look uh you know, you always want to find the flaws in something to make sure that you're not making a mistake. So, you know, it's 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 sort of my job to kind of poke holes at it to make sure that that all their T's are crossed and I's are dotted, so that there aren't any unintended consequences. And because of the fact the the bill the way it was before had pretty much um, uh, uh, made almost every crime except for the listed crimes uh, to be eligible that those are a lot of crimes. I mean, there's a big long list and the sentencing commission, I don't believe that they went through uh, individually each crime to say, hey, does this uh, make sense? Um, you know, there's a, you know there, there's still more out there that I'm sure probably were not intended to, you know, to make them um, uh, eligible here. I mean, one that can come to mind right now. And again, I'm not trying to do anything to the bill. It's something for you all to think about in the future, but just sort of explain why I have my hesitancy. And one is, uh, you know, if you had a misdemeanor battery by a police officer, uh, we, don't, we don't want police officers who've been arrested for batter, you know, for for assaulting individuals. So if if you got a situation where a police officer has been convicted of, of assault, um, I certainly. I'm going to be one who would oppose that, you know, that being expunged. Um, I, I just, it's, so there are things like that. It's not, again, not being opposed to the bill. I just want to make sure that, that uh, 
everyone knows that when you're making this type of policy decision, it should be based on, you know, that you know all of the facts and uh, to make sure that any unintended consequences are covered. Great, thank you. And uh, I do like your idea of, you know, going forward at some point of uh, um, the, uh, the accused or whatever you want to call them having a, uh, um, a chance to, I guess you could say, rebut the prosecutor if, if a prosecutor says uh, no expungement. I, I think that's a good idea. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And, and John, we can certainly consider um, adding um, simple assault by a law enforcement officer uh, to the list of, of uh, um, crimes that are ineligible. I just, I don't, you know, the thing is, I, I'm sorry, because I, I feel like I, every time I come here, I'm giving you another one, but, you know, you don't think about them because, you, you, you know, days go by and then you're in the middle of the night and you think, oh, wait, how about that one? You know, so, so that's clearly one, especially, you know, looking at what's happened across this country right now. Um, you know, there are people in law enforcement who shouldn't be there. No, absolutely. So I appreciate that and um, have made note of that. In the next draft week because we will have some changes anyway from from today so oh. thank you great Thanks. thank you so much great right. nice to meet you evan okay let's go to uh the attorney general's office david share thank you madam chair and thank you to the committee for the record david chair with the attorney general's office uh, the Attorney General is grateful to this committee for taking this bill up again. This is a priority for the Attorney General. He's a strong believer in expungements, a strong believer that uh, for the reasons many have testified to already, the second chance, the expansion of economic opportunity, uh, the expansion of Vermont's workforce, this is an important bill and we really appreciate the committee uh, pushing forward on it. Uh, obviously, we supported a more expansive version of expungement than the one that's been being talked about today, but we certainly still support what's here today and we're happy to um, help think through ways in which we could respond to some of the concerns brought up by uh, folks last week. And we do think that this bill is responds to a lot of the concerns that were brought forward. And I think in fact, eliminates a lot of the concerns that were brought forward. And I think it's uh, um, you know very reasonable uh, response to those, and it is something that I, I believe, uh, and I think most witnesses, although not all, have have noted, uh, does in fact uh, address a bunch of the concerns that were brought up. And I was pleased to hear uh, witnesses express that. There are a couple of things I did want to address right now uh, with respect to some of the uh, issues that have been discussed this afternoon. Um, you know, one thing. Uh, I will note just briefly is some of the, I believe the offense that um, uh, Attorney Campbell mentioned is one that is currently eligible. So it's not a policy change that the bill is, uh, con that this bill is contemplating. That being said, you know, always open for discussion. And one broader point I think is really necessary to emphasize is that it's not like any of these offenses under this statutory construct are happening without review. They all are reviewed by a prosecutor and ultimately by a court. And the prosecutors retain the discretion to say that they uh, do not agree to an expungement, that they object to it. And then a court will be the decider on that. And I think courts will take into consideration reasonable concerns of a prosecutor. I can say to this committee that there have been cases coming out of the attorney general's office that involved former officers uh, who did ask for expungements for crimes related to um, misuse of their official authority. And we did oppose, even though we are broadly in agreement with expungement, we did oppose those because we did feel like um, it is important that the public, uh, that we not be seen as Putting, assisting in putting a veil over a misuse of government authority, which can be very profound uh, impact when it's, you're talking about law enforcement. And all that is to say that you know, the, the system already has checks and balances built into it, uh, checks and balances that our system has been able to use. And, and also to give you the broader picture, we are very, you know, we have we stipulate to the vast majority of expungements that appear before us, but uh, in a couple very narrow instances, we do think public policy uh, means that um, our prosecutorial 
discretion to object should be used and we have used it. And I think that that's important to remember um, that that system is not changing and, and remains in place. A couple other points I really think that are important to make here. One is with respect to the risk assessment concern. Um, the, the, the data is clear and the studies are clear that all these older offenses are not relevant to risk assessments when, uh, you know, after a sufficient amount of time has passed, it's important to state very, that I want to state very clearly, this bill does not allow for any uh, sex related offense to be expunged or sealed. So I want there not to be any confusion about that when we talk about this stuff. Those are not eligible for expungement now. They will not be eligible for expungement if this bill were to pass. I think that what the department was talking about was if somebody is perhaps accused of such an offense after something has been expunged, that that expunged offense perhaps could um, inform their risk assessment. I think uh, Mr. DeMora testified clearly, and I, I think the literature shows very clearly that any risk assessment that that takes that into account is an inaccurate risk assessment. They simply don't uh, have any predictive effect, and they certainly don't have any relevancy. You know, if you if you have something like, say, I don't know, some sort of low-level misdemeanor that gets expunged, a drug possession offense or something like that, that really has nothing whatsoever to do 10 years down the road with a much more serious offense related to a sex offense. It would have no bearing on the, or should, and I think the data shows, and I've spoken with Mr. DeMora about this, the data shows that it should have no bearing on the um, the supervision decisions that are made for somebody who is ultimately accused of that much more serious offense than the one that may have been expunged. That expunged offense, after a period of time, simply has no relevant um, impact or import for decision making about um, how to supervise somebody. And again, we're talking about it's important to remember these are different categories of harm, different categories of offense where these expungements that we're talking about are, are not really, especially given how old they are. Um, well, I should say there's two things going on. One, they're old. And for that reason, they don't have predictive power. And two, uh, it is important to remember that they are different types of harmful behaviors. And the one is not really going to have that much to say about the other in terms of supervision risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. One other piece I did want to mention is, uh, and Representative Alon mentioned this, to the extent that the executive branch of the government is making decisions about supervision and potentially supervising people more harshly on the basis of behavior for which somebody has never been convicted, I think that is concerning, and I don't know if that's happening or not. I um, I can only go, you know, by by what I heard. So I, I and I'm not sure. I may have misheard, but uh, certainly I don't think that there's any sort of public policy reason to be retaining and acting upon accusations which the judicial arm of the state decided were not something that somebody was going to be convicted of for whatever, you know, for whatever reason that happened. Uh, it may have been because they were completely innocent of that accusation. So I, I just think that's really important to keep in mind. And so sure, we have a lot of plea agreements. Um, but that's how our that's how the system works here and everywhere in the country. And uh, we make decisions after that plea agreement on the basis of what somebody is convicted of, not on the basis of what they're not convicted of. So I think uh, I just wanted to reemphasize those points. Um, and I do think that Mr. DeMora's point is really important that, um, you know, if they're making decisions on a very old underlying offense that has, you know, nothing to do with a current, much more serious, much different offense in nature, that's not really, as again, as I have had conversations with Mr. DeMora about this, that isn't really evidence-based. Um, and uh, it certainly is not impacting public safety. You know, it's certainly not harmfully impacting public safety. It's, it's um, just not really related to um, 
public safety considerations, nor it's not necessary. And, and again, I do think the um, folks who really study this stuff, uh, and Mr. Demora is our is the expert we have, and one that the administration has repeatedly invoked when they are talking about these concerns. That that's in writing, and I think a couple documents now in front of the committee, and. That expert, also invoked by the administration, has said to you and has said to me in other conversations that um, these simply are not, these old expunged offenses simply are not relevant for assessing uh, risk down the road. And I think that that is the best information we have. Uh, Mr. Demora has um, resources that he can share with the committee to back that. And uh, I think that's the expertise that we certainly are paying attention to. And I think that it would be appropriate for the committee to pay attention to that as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. I really, I really appreciate it. And I also really appreciate you and your office um, working on this latest draft and, um, and helping us move forward uh, on this important issue. And I really appreciate um, yours and the Attorney General's um, commitment to this important justice reform. So thank you. Uh, committee, any questions? Tom. <laughs> Came in late again. No, I just wanted to thank David, as you just did, for his work on this, and, you know, and his considerations for the, I guess you could say the amendments that we made. Uh, uh, you know, full disclosure, David and I talked offline about it. And, um, um, he gave me his ideas on, you know, what, what we could possibly do to make it, uh, uh, make it better for, you know, people's different ideas. And, um, and, and he came up with good ideas and I just wanted to thank him for that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, representative. Yeah. Other, uh, other committee members. Questions? Oh. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, there we go, Ken. <laughs> Getting later, I guess I'm old. Um, with all the, um, the, the expungements and the, and the court backlog that we're already under and this bill, I think, what, uh, July 1st or something like that, are we gonna have time to do, um, is, do much expungement? And also, um, you know, the case backload and all that other stuff, the money and all that stuff. I mean, the courts are already really backed up, right? My understanding is, yes, there is going to be a big backlog. And I also, I'm not involved in these discussions personally, so I, I don't want to misrepresent, but I do understand that there's a lot of discussion happening right now that should hopefully result in some serious funding to help address that backlog. That, that, is, that is correct, uh, because all along there have been um, concerns expressed about the backlog and, and where expungements, uh, how, how expungements might play into that. And, um, and there has been quite, there are ongoing discussions um, between the other body, between our joint fiscal office and um, helping to alleviate the backlog. I mean, we've done a tremendous amount, or somebody's done a tremendous amount of, of, of expungements already in the last, I don't know, I, I think I came on in 2018. Um, I mean, is there a lot more, lot more to do? Certainly there's a lot more we can think about. I mean, it, you know, there's, uh, the, in the earlier version of this bill did a lot more than, than the current version. Again, I think we've tried to, address a lot of concerns and the changes. Um, and we, I still think it's an important step forward that will help a lot of people. That being said, I, I, I do think that there's more we could do and there's more we can think about in terms of designing a system that may be um, faster to, or, or create less of a burden on courts and, uh, and people who are seeking expungements. There's a number of different ideas in terms of avenues we could go down. Ultimately, it'll be up to, you all on the committee and, and others to decide whether or not this is something you want to pursue anymore. But I, I do think that there's fruitful thought and discussion and potentially future action um, with respect to making our system better. 
and I just I just want to be fair to the uh, to the victims. That's all. And I just I just wonder how much more we we're going to go on this before we lose sight of that if we haven't already. That's my concern. Thanks. I appreciate that concern, Representative, and and I think it is important to remember that prosecutors do currently retain the ability to object and to do whatever they need to do to uh, take into consideration victim issues. And again, even in, in what we are very open and, and we usually stipulate, but we have felt that there were very occasionally a couple of times where we thought it wasn't appropriate for us to, excuse me, appropriate for us to stipulate. And so I think that the mechanism is there now to uh, ensure that those issues are being taken care of. But again, if there are future changes that raise those concerns to a greater height, uh, I have no doubt that we can discuss how to make sure that those are being adequately taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, David, it's my understanding that um, in state's attorney's offices, um, there are victims advocates that work within the state's attorney's office and um, perhaps in your office as well, correct? Yes, that, that's a very important point, Madam Chair. Every state's attorney's office, I believe, and yes, every state's attorney's office has at least, um, a, I'm, I'm only hesitating because of budgetary, like the way the full-time equivalents get divided up between offices. So I'm hesitating over a budgetary issue, not a substantive issue. Every, every state's attorney's office has access to victims advocate services, whether that's one or more. Um, person who assists in those tasks for, and they, their job is to reach out to victims and work with them to ensure that their interests are being adequately considered and they have a, a real clear line of communication with the prosecutor's offices who are prosecuting cases. We have somebody in our office who serves in that role as well, who's really excellent. Um, and actually she helps a lot with statewide policy issues. She's, Amy Farr is a wonderful victims advocate, but those are, uh, there's somebody like that who assists every office and in some cases, multiple people who assist those offices. Thank you. Barbara. Sorry, did you, <laughs> Barbara. Thank you, yeah. so David. Does your office have a position on what Judge Gerson was asking today about pushing the marijuana expungement back to January 2023? We don't have a position on that at this time. It's not something I'd heard about until just now. Uh, obviously, we're in agreement with the underlying policy of uh, having mm -hmm. those things expunged. It makes no sense to have something on somebody's record that's not even a crime in the state anymore. Uh, but I hadn't heard about that, and I'd have to sort of take a moment and, and talk with some folks to, to understand the implications there a little more. Okay. I, I would definitely love to hear from you after you have, because I, I, I've got to say, like, when I heard that, it just kind of, um, it would be pushing about two years from our original plan. Um, and I understand about COVID, but also understand about extra resources. and. In some ways, expungement stuff can happen even when the courts are closed. So I, yeah, I, I have concern about that. I, I appreciate your concern, Representative, and I uh, just want to do my due diligence before. Yes, I, I absolutely. Lay, uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Uh, anybody else? Again, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate Great. your work on this. So, okay, our last witness is Marshall Pauls from Defender General's Office. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. hanging in a long day. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? I've been having some microphone trouble. Great. So um, I just wanted to start off by saying that um, our office was in here when this bill first came over from the Senate. And if you recall our testimony on that bill, the bill that had been voted on by the Senate was very supportive that it was a big step forward, that it was important work. Um, our testimony has changed quite a bit. We don't oppose this bill and I wanna make sure that's clear from the get-go. I think that this bill makes 
very small, very incremental progress, but this is not a good bill. This is a bad bill. It doesn't do very much. It's responding to some 11th hour concerns that were that are, you know, frankly should have been raised much earlier. I mean, when you look at where this bill's genesis is, where it came from, this bill came from the Sentencing Commission. This was worked on extensively in the Sentencing Commission. The Sentencing Commission has the Department of Corrections on it, and they did not raise these concerns when this bill was being worked on in the Sentencing Commission. The Sentencing Commission has state's attorneys and sheriffs on it. They did not raise this concern when it was being worked on in the Sentencing Commission. Um, this bill has members of the Department of Public, or the Sentencing Commission has the members of the Department of Public Safety on it. There was not these concerns raised during that process. Moreover, this went through the entire Senate. In the Senate, this was supported by the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. There was no opposition from DOC. There was no opposition from Department of Public Safety. There was no opposition from anyone else in the administration. This all came up in this sort of 11th hour status, which is why we continued actually to support this bill. If it wasn't for the last piece of this bill, which sends the bill over to Joint Justice Oversight for, um, you know, for further for further look at what should be not done next in the world of expungement. Um, I don't think we would support this bill because, and the reason why we support that change, shifting it from the Sentencing Commission to Joint Justice Oversight, is because honestly, at this point, it should be a legislative process. It's become clear that no matter what work the Sentencing Commission does, it's not going to. You know, the whole idea of the Sentencing Commission was to make it so that the sort of, you know, fine tooth comb, nitty gritty work of picking through all the different, um, you know, avenues for expungement and sealing that are out there, deciding what's appropriate in what circumstances and drafting a law that really reflects that. Um, you know, it, the whole point of, of sending that work to the Sentencing Commission rather than having it be done as part of the legislative process was that it is, you know, sort of too detailed, too in-depth to really happen during the legislative process. But, you know, it's pretty clear that no matter what the Sentencing Commission does, it's going to end up resulting in having to go through with fine-tooth comb during the legislative process anyway. And if that's the case, then that's where it belongs. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't belong in the Sentencing Commission if the work of the Sentencing Commission isn't really going to be reflected in the legislative process. And so we support this bill because um, it does the what we think is a valuable service of taking this, uh, the, you know, the next stages of expungement and stealing out of the Sentencing Commission, putting them in front of Joint Justice Oversight. Um, and we think that that'll be a, an improvement over the process as it is now. Um, the process that sort of got us to this state uh, of, you know, responding to 11th hour concerns. Um, so frankly, you know, I don't think this is a great bill. I don't think it's even a good bill. Uh, it doesn't really do much as far as expungements go. It doesn't really, you know, open the door to that many more expungements than were on the table before. And frankly, the other changes don't really do much of anything at all. And so from our perspective, the value in this bill at this point is just in changing the venue of where the conversation is happening. Um, and it's for that reason that we don't oppose it and in fact support that component of it. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, Ken. So let me make sure I get this right. You don't like this bill and oppose this bill because it doesn't go far enough uh, into expungement? Yes. Um, so first off, we don't oppose the bill. We, I just think it's a bad bill that doesn't do very much. What it does do is valuable and we support that little piece of it. But honestly, this bill does not make many changes to the expungement process. It doesn't make many changes to the scope of expungement. It, you know, frankly, it doesn't do much. So um, our, our perspective on it is that this was sort of a failed attempt to expand expungement. Um, ultimately, this bill doesn't do much at all to expand expungement. 
um, which from our perspective makes the bill for the most part a failure. So let me so let me ask it another way. So 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 you want a bill that does more uh, to exp to expunge more 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 crimes, correct? Correct. Um, in fact, the bill that was originally introduced in the Senate, which was a reflection of the work that the Sentencing Commission had done and that was voted out of the Senate. Um, that bill did in fact increase the scope of expungement so that substantially more crimes were eligible for expungement than are eligible now. This bill, as it's written now, does not really substantially expand the number of offenses eligible for expungement. Thank you, sir. Martin. Actually, I have a question I think for, for, for Bryn, I wanna make sure I understand something. If, uh, if Bryn is still Bryn there, still there or I know she's multitasking. Um, could, could you just remind me, because there's lots of strikeouts and additions and moving around and stuff. Can you remind me what, what additional crimes we are adding uh, to the ability to expunge in this bill? Sure. Um, so the many of those felony property offenses are not currently eligible for expungement. I think I said earlier that at least one is, but most of them are not currently eligible for expungement. So can I ask just a real quick follow-up question then? So, so the sections I'm looking at on page six, seven, with all that strikeout language, that's just struck out from what we got from the Senate or is it? No, the, 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 the struck out language in six and seven is. Oh, I, I see, I'm sorry, I forget that. I, I actually just used my eyes and read it and now I see what it is. I apologize, keep going, keep going, I'm sorry. So that's existing law. And it's not that those are no longer eligible. It's that we've condensed them into C and D on page seven. Right. So um, you're also expanding it to the the selling, dispensing, and transporting of regulated drugs. So that's um, an additional new category of, of crime that are, are now eligible. Okay, and, and most of uh, subsection five, those property crimes? Most of those are, are not currently eligible, are new. And there are some uh, misdemeanor offenses that are not currently eligible, but are um, under S7. So I, I appreciate that. And, and I guess I don't have a question, but I do have to make a comment uh, that I do think this bill does advance things. I also um, understand the role of the Sentencing com Commission is to, is to make recommendations. But I also understand that we in the House do a very good job of our due diligence and, and want to make sure that we look deeply. And, and I think uh, other people out there understand that and will come to us as well with uh, concerns. Uh, because they know that we are looking really taking a deep dive on these. And I think we've done our due diligence and I think this is a good bill. So um, not a question there, I'm sorry, Marshall, just, just not agreeing with you, your, your perspective on this one, thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, Marshall, do you want to uh, comment on pushing out the, um, the cannabis um, expungements to uh, 2023? I would have to take a look at that. That was new to me today. And so I have not had a chance to um, just sort of look at what the collateral effects of that would be. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, if you if you can and let us know, um, that'd be great. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Kate. Thanks, sorry, I'm having some connectivity stuff. So my video is gonna stay up. Again, this might be a question for Bryn. I remain stuck on the section of the bill having to do with folks who are under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. And I'm wondering, what was my question? Um, I guess one, I'm wondering if prior to this bill, so currently, are there offenses that someone under the supervision of the Department of Corrections could seek expungement for? Like essentially is this bill in front of us limiting uh, further what someone under probation could access? Is that, are you, is that a question for me or for the witness? 
I think maybe for, I, I either whoever can answer it. I'm guessing it might be for you, but so um, under S seven, one of one of the changes that S seven makes, and the Senate passed version makes this change as well, is to um, is to pretty explicitly provide that expungement or sealing is not eligible until the person has completed. Um, or satisfy the judgment for either the uh, underlying conviction or any subsequent conviction. Um, so that that language is uh, in the Senate pass version as well. Um, so the new language that was added in that subdivision two earlier on in the bill, um, I think was is really intended to um, to make it explicitly clear that a person who's under supervision couldn't um, have access to sealing or expungement, but I think that those changes that were made even in the Senate version already kind of achieved that objective. Thanks, and just quick follow up on that question. So one of the things that's outlined is um, as, as an offense that can be expunged is one that's no longer illegal. Um, given the language that is in this new version of the bill, um, that just says, you know, they shall not be eligible for sealing or expungement. Would that include um, eligibility for sealing or expungement of, of a crime that's no longer illegal? Yes, I believe that it would. It, its placement in the bill, um, I think, would make it apply to, to everything that's eligible for sealing or expungement, which would include um, conduct that's no longer considered criminal. Thanks. I, I, I guess I would like to flag that a little bit. It feels concerning to me that folks would not be eligible for expungement of something that is not deemed illegal anymore for what it's worth. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marshall, did you wanna respond or no? No, I think Bryn covered it. Yeah, thank you. Any, uh, any other questions for Marshall uh, or for Bryn? Not seeing any. Okay, well, again, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's been a long day. I appreciate everybody staying.